I just spent 70 days, over seven years, trying to climb 15 moves in a row. And looking back now, I feel like I probably could have done it in about a third of the time. Think of bad tactics like running through a forest at night, you're smashing into branches and trees and tripping over tree roots and whatever else is in your way. But good tactics is taking a moment to stop, breathe, look around and see, actually, there's a highway right here and it's going in the same direction. I'm gonna to get to the same place at the end and I'm gonna get there a lot sooner and way less battered kind of a win-win really. So there's three big tactic takeaways for me on this project. Number one was look at me, look at the climb and work out what needs to happen. I didn't take a critical assessment of myself as a climber coming into this route. Historically, I was a pumper at that time and looking at this route, it was a boulder as route. 15 very hard moves in a row likely over in about 60 seconds, as opposed to 15 minutes, which was what I was used to. Plus, it was at an angle that I was really unfamiliar with. Most of the climbing I do here at home is vert to 30 degrees overhung. I'm not hanging out at that angle very often. Alarm bells should have been sounding for me at this point, but it just wasn't. Tom, this route is very different to what you're used to, and you're gonna need to do something entirely different, but I just didn't. Historically, I've just shown up to the cliff, spent a bit of time training on the route, and Bob's your uncle after a few days, it's done. But that just wasn't going to be the case. I very much fell into the trap with this route of approaching it with that, what got me here is also going to get me there, which really is just kind of amateur league stuff. After the first three seasons that I spent on this project, I then went and trained to try and qualify for the Olympics because the climate that I was was not good enough to qualify for the Olympics. And I eventually did after lots of training and then I went off to the Olympics and did even more training. And I came back to this route. I was a completely different climber and climbed it in that season with way less fuss and bother because I'd actually shown up as the climber that I'd always needed to be. Two, flipping the switch into game time. After so much time projecting, linking, and thinking about what the next step could be along the path to finally doing the red point, I forgot the most important part of all, and that's actually just pulling on to red point. As silly as it may sound, I don't think I ever pulled onto this route with the full intention, full commitment to a red point until the go that I actually sent it. Which may seem funny because I fell off the second last move maybe a dozen times and yeah sure I was trying to do the route but just became this whole process of just whittling it down more and more and more. I felt like there was always just this little bit just holding back and maybe a bit of nerves or a bit of like something like I just never really <laughs> went I'm doing this, it is my time to stand up and make this happen. On that last time that I pulled on to try and red point, I was dealing with the potential of full carnage on my finger and more about that in that full video that I made about this send. But I think mentally having to commit 100% to this and knowing that if it didn't pay off, I was up for weeks of skin recovery. That just flicked me into the mindset of all on, like everything's on red for this go. And that really did make a big difference for me to just pull on and have a go. Hey buddy, here's a little mags coming up to say hi. Hello, hello. Blech. No thank you. You gonna help me? Fun fact, she's a Jack Russell cross pug, which is a jug. Really ask yourself next time you're pulling off the ground for a red point, am I 100% committed to this go? Small interruption. Perhaps one of the most frequent non-climbing related questions that I get is, Tom, how can I support you more? I love what you're doing. I love all the content. I love everything. What can I do to support all of this? Do you have a Patreon? And the answer now is yes. So if you want to be a part of the Patreon, the Sunset Frothers crew, you can be a part of it. One tier, everything is in there. Behind the scenes, uncut, 
Q and A's, like board session, like everything's going to be in there. Videos that I haven't quite fleshed out the idea of that you can help me so that I can provide the most value to the whole main channel. It's really going to be supporting this main channel. So if you want to be a part of it, jump on in. Love to see you in there. There is the full like eight and a bit minutes, I think it is, of the like go to stop recording of the uncut of the Humper Trouble send footage. So if you want to see all of that, the nervousness of chatting with my Blair and then just the send, post send, psych and froth and all of that, it's there as the first video. So if you want to be a part of it all, jump on in. I cannot wait to see you in there. Number three is the one percenters. Anyone that's been climbing for long enough or really doing anything in life for long enough will understand the compounding effect of getting all the little things lined up in your favor or potentially not in your favor. When I'm at the cliff, I see climbers making mistakes all the time that are just so simple to fix and I am 100% in that category with this and I made a bunch of them on this route. Honestly, I avoided addressing them to my own detriment. I do have quite sweaty fingers and each night before I go to bed, I could have put the rhino skin on that is sat there on my bedside table, but I didn't. I can struggle to breathe sometimes while climbing and I could have just stepped off the ground and thought, my intention for this go is to actually breathe, but I didn't. I could have made sure that my hands were staying properly toasty between attempts so that I wasn't numbing out right at the very top there, but I didn't. Ultimately, I think these were the biggest three factors for me and the time that I actually pulled off the ground Having done all of these things, I did eventually send, which makes me think maybe it could have happened a lot sooner. Not only do the negative effects of these little things compound, but so too the positive effects. Ultimately for me on this project, I just had bogus tactics and I'm gonna continue to make mistakes throughout my climbing life and that's okay. The thing is, we're just gonna come back and course correct and get back on that highway going in the right direction, out of the forest, seeing things clearly. If you want to know more about the actual physical training that I did for this route right at the very end, you can check out this video right here. And if you haven't yet already seen the full video about the whole story right here, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate you all. See you next time.